why don't the amount of time you spend making that space elevator, you could have built a ship that could go to Alpha Centauri or something, you know? <laughs> hey, Jackery, what's going on? Let us the expanse already. Ah, oh, Seamus, you'll get no argument from me there. Uh, you know what, dude? The, the thing is, is that NASA is on the verge of making something... L not NASA, they're not, and not really on the verge. It's already been done. Uh, we're not going to get an Epstein drive by any time soon, unless fusion because of, becomes a thing, and everybody knows that's 20 years away, right? Um, maybe soon. I mean, the advances in fusion are going fast, but everybody says that all the time. So there is another form of propulsion that could help do what I call expand our dexterity in space. So we wouldn't get necessarily to the expanse, but we could get close. That propulsion is nuclear thermal. Uh, it's basically a, rock, a nuclear rocket engine. Yeah, nuclear thermal propulsion, or NTR for short. NASA and the Department of Energy are working on that right now. It's kind of low-key. They do it in the background because nuclear. People hear nuclear and they, ah, you know. Even Joey is confused by the water tower. How did they... Th it's literally rained on the camera before during a crewed mission, Sebi. How do they not notice? Eh, whatever. It's fine. Uh, so... Any hope for the Alcubierre or drive theory? The mathematic the mathematical formulas have been proven, but it needs to be peer reviewed and then it needs to be tested after that. Maybe. Negative mass density might be a thing. I mean it seems right, but that that's getting into stuff that I don't understand. <laughs> I know how the regular rockets work. <laughs> Switch to just chatting and back. Only for you, BB. How about I just retitle the stream to Space and Rocket Review? How about EJ's Space and Rocket Review? Switch us back over to S&T. There we go. <clears throat> yeah, Sebi, the, the sound suppressor is totally normal. Yeah, no problem, drum. Yeah, nuclear thermal, nuclear thermal guys can double the efficiency, double the efficiency of a, of a rocket engine flying right now. Um, so if you, okay, this is going to get into some very basic rocket science. Some nerd stuff's going to come at you. Just, just bear with me. Okay. So say you have a rocket, you have an upper stage, right? So the part that flies around actually up in space. So you have an upper stage. And your upper stage is 10 tons, okay? One ton of that is upper stage, and nine tons of it is the fuel inside. Fuel and oxidizer, right? Because you need to bring the oxygen with you with a regular rocket, okay? And then say you have 10 tons of payload. If the propellants that you're carrying are the, the most efficient chemical propellants that we have nowadays, so hydrogen and oxygen, just, I, I'm making up numbers here, but you could do the math out on this if you really wanted to. Taking into a, a account a specific impulse of like 450, y you could get a rocket, I don't know, maybe to the moon, maybe 10 tons to the moon with that, with that, with those numbers, those numbers are really loose. Uh, your, your range might be to the moon. With a nuclear rocket, and now keep in mind, that's a one-way trip, so that means by the time you reach the speed to be able to get to the moon, the rocket's out of gas. You got no, you got no propellants left, no commodities left on board the vehicle. So hopefully you have something that can step on the brakes when you get to the moon and, and you can land. If that same exact stage was nuclear powered with a nuclear engine, it's about double the range. So meaning you could go to the moon, stop at the moon, and then come back, come back to Earth. We're talking about a 50% increase, actually not a 50, a 100% increase in, in efficiency. And efficiency on a spacecraft will increase your range. Uh, what is efficiency on a, on a, for a rocket engine? Uh, it's called specific impulse. Uh, specific impulse, if you want to be very, very, very uh, general, it's how fast the gas comes out the back of the rocket. Yeah, how fast is it coming out? It comes out faster, you can go faster. Uh, specific impulse is akin to the miles per gallon. So that's the MPG of a rocket engine, so to speak. It's the efficiency. Um, 
If you have a higher specific impulse, and nuclear engines do, then you can go further in space. Keep in mind, once again, this is, very, this is scratching the surface with rocket science. It's just scratching the surface here. Uh, spacecraft range is not measured in distance, it's measured in acceleration. Yeah. So if you can accelerate to this speed, you can get to the moon. If you have a rocket that's sitting on a launch pad, and that rocket can accelerate its payload to 23,000 miles an hour, you have enough... You have enough energy on board that vehicle to be able to get some, shoot something at the moon. So like the Saturn V can, can accelerate a vehicle past 23,000 miles an hour because they went to the moon, landed, and then came back. Keep in mind, you, you have to take into account staging. So you're dumping parts of the vehicle as you go further into space, which makes, uh, which alleviates what's called dry mass. Dry mass is uh, parts of the spacecraft that's not fuel. So when your first stage is out of fuel, you dump it and your dry mass goes down and your mass to fuel ratio goes up, increasing your delta V or range of the vehicle. Think about it like if you had uh, two or three fuel tanks in the back of a pickup truck and you were driving it across the country and when one of the fuel tanks emptied, instead of carrying it along with you, you throw it overboard. Don't do that. The truck would be lighter, right? And you'd be able to increase your range. Same idea with rockets, but... Car, car's efficiency and rocket efficiency is two different things. Yeah, you get better fuel economy, Jay, mm -hmm. because of what's called, what's called mass fraction. Mass fraction is basically the amount of rocket you have on your rocket and the amount of fuel you have on your rocket. This is very simple rocket science stuff, guys. This is something you could learn playing Kerbal. This is basics of the basics. Like I'm moving a trailer in a truck after dropping all the load. Pretty much wild. Yeah, you're you're decreasing your dry mass. Dry mass is anything on the vehicle that's not fuel. There you go, Wave. Yeah, there's another good analogy. Mm -hmm. Close enough to space news to count. Oh, neat. Is the big tank in a gasoline fuel truck connected to the engine fuel tank? Is the big tank in the gas truck connected to the engine fuel tank? What? Are you talking about the analogy, O Force, or my truck? I'm confused. Guys, why in the name of frick are you talking about President Nixon? I'm trying to teach rocket science over here. You guys are talking about you guys are talking about talking about presidents. Who cares? Stop it! Stop! Stop this! You stop this now. Are we going to go into MSC right after Space News, or do you have something lined up in between? Flykin, do you want to see my summer car? Because I'm going to do the opposite of whatever you want. So just yeah. And now that I said that, you're going to suggest the opposite, so I'm just going to do it. You know. Just gonna do the opposite of what you want. I want whatever you want to do. Well, now I don't want to do that anymore. See, last question. Sure, Sile, what's up? Is it like dropping a wheel in Oklahoma to go faster? Uh, the analogy breaks down when you start losing wheels because you kind of need that. <laughs> No, it was not more efficient. I did not, uh, Laser Man, I did not, in fact, go further on three wheels. I, I didn't go nearly as far as I could have on four. Just, I mean, just putting it out there. Just, just putting it out there. Realistically, as an educated guess, what would be roughly the furthest humanity could be able to travel in the next 100 years? That's a hard question to say, Sialkovsky. Are, are we going on the same rate of iteration that we are going on right now? If we keep going at this pace, I don't know, 100 years? We could be out to Pluto in 100 years, sure, no problem. Yeah, exactly, like, see, I mean, it was in fact less efficient. Turns out when you jettison parts that, you know, make the vehicle do, it doesn't work. It'd be like a rocket jettisoning the engine to be more efficient. 
I was thinking about how SpaceX wanted to catch the ship, but wouldn't that be kind of dangerous for crew flights? Say the booster crashes into the tower and puts it out of commission. How would they land? Pigzig, the idea is to... Uh, the idea is to basically test it to the point and lose however many boosters and starships you need to to the point where they can get that technology matured and reliable. That's the plan. So, well, you do pose a good question. SpaceX, what Elon would probably say, and don't get me wrong, I don't speak for the guy, would, he would probably say that they're just going to test it until it works, however long that may take. Yeah, JJ, it'd be pretty sweet. Yeah, Wiser, exactly. That's what I mean about going at the same technological pace. If we keep going at this pace, oh yeah, Starship will be flying in five years pretty routinely, I would say. And that's a pretty conservative estimate. Elon says it'll be flying in 2023. I, I, I don't know. I'd say people in five years. But then again, they need to have that lander ready by 2025, which that's three, three, three years away. So, I mean, it could. It really depends. There's a lot of stuff that needs to go right to be able to get people flying on Starship. But there's a thousand things that could go wrong to get people to not fly on Starship. You know what I mean? You're playing kind of a, you're playing a game here. The, the key is to get that thing launching a lot and understand the tech. Like, look, a Falcon 9 lands every time now, nowadays. It, it, when's the last time a Falcon 9 had a problem? You know, the last time I can remember that it had a problem was where one of the boosters had a ripped heat blanket and it burned up during re-entry. That was like a year ago. And then before that, I can't remember the last time a landing got botched. CRS-16? Before that? And then anything before that? Falcon, a couple Falcon Heavy Cores did a couple of weird things, but comparatively for like 101 landings... It's pretty freaking good. I mean, don't get me wrong. That's still not even favorable for human flight. That's not even close to the statistics that you want. But as Falcon 9 flies more, those, you know, the, the safety and the reliability of it will go, will go up. I'm honestly expecting SpaceX would build an escape system for Starship. That's, no, they won't, username. It's not, it's not part of the construct that Starship is trying to, it's not part of the systems engineering, uh, for the problem that Starship is trying to solve. A launch escape system on Starship is about as dumb as a launch escape system on a 747. That doesn't really make a whole lick of sense, does it? Now, don't get me wrong. A lot of people hear me say that, and they think, oh, well, you don't think rockets should have launch escape systems, EJ? What about the space shuttle that one time? That has nothing to do with it. If the, engin if the rocket's engineered to not have a launch escape system, you best be planning other ways to, oh, I don't know, make it so the people don't die? Probably, probably a good idea. Uh, just like a 747 is, you know, very reliable. People fly on it a lot, even though it doesn't have a launch escape system, because because it'll get you where you need to go. Starship needs to get to that point. So, once again, the systems engineering, it doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for the high frequency of flight, putting a launch escape system on it. At least that's what SpaceX is trying to do. Now, if you disagree with that, that's fine. SpaceX disagrees with you. So, and they're the one that launches the rocket, so it's really up to them. Uh, simultaneously, though, that doesn't mean that ro all rockets shouldn't have launch escape systems. The idea is to understand what's called systems engineering. What are you trying to do? That's the, that's the fundamental answer for engineering. What are you trying to do? Not why did you do it? What are you doing? If you ever ask an engineer, well, hey, could we build a space elevator? Or hey, could we do this? Well, it depends. What are you trying to do? That's what they'll say like 100% of the time. So like SLS, for instance. SLS is, you know, best case, best case scenario, going to fly four times a year. The infrequency of flight with that system warrants a launch escape system. You're not going to fly it all the time. So you're increasing the probability of something going wrong because you're not flying it as much, right? A rocket sitting on the sitting in the hangar doing nothing is that's one costing you a ton of money and two, you you know, cuz you're cuz the infrequency of flight, you the safety risk goes up. This is a problem that they ended up having with the shuttle, believe it or not. The infrequency of launches with the shuttle ended up causing more problems. 
if you're going to launch the shuttle four times a year, you probably, probably should have some kind of launch escape system on it, but, well, we never did that. Uh, so, like, something like SLS, because best case scenario, you're going to get four launches a year, right? Best case scenario, you probably should put a launch escape system on it. It makes much more sense with how you're trying to get people into space, right? Do you think Dear Moon could launch next year like it was announced? My guess is 2026, Lundprod, but who knows? You, oh, speaking of that, Yusaku Mezawa is going to launch on another Soyuz flight because he can, and he's going to do an EVA. That's what I heard. I don't. I forget where I heard that information, though, so that might... Hmm. Uh, that, that's what I was hearing. I don't know. That one's, that one's a source to say, so take that one with a grain of salt. Yeah, risk managing. Exactly, Soapbox. You got it. Mm -hmm. The further humans go, the more fail-safes we're going to need. Well, it, once again, son, it depends on what you're doing. It depends. What the frick? Why does he need EVA? Because he has screw you money and he can do what he wants, dot com. That's more money for space flight as far as I'm concerned, dude. I don't have a problem with this, do you? If you had money to burn like that and you liked space, wouldn't you do that? I would do that. That'd be sweet. I understand that. That's why I appended it with if it takes us sufficiently long enough to land to land the landing. Yeah. Yeah, serious. I'm, I'd actually, dude, if I had Yusaku Mizawa money, I'd probably, I don't know. I like engineering the vehicles. I'd want to build my own. If I had Yusaku Mizawa money, I'd probably, I'd probably try to necro the X-33 because, just because, man. Just, just because. I don't care if I lose. I wouldn't care if I lose. Lost money on that. That would be amazing. I'd go to Lockheed and be like, "Yo, that thing. I want that thing." <laughs> I don't know username. Not sure. It's kind of all up in, all up in the air right now. Not literally though. Yeah, there you go, Wisp. Right. <laughs> Some of my friends think space tourism is bad because it's all because it's only pollution. What should I tell them? It's only pollution. Smoke Whenever I encounter people with that kind of attitude, "Oh, it's only pollution." That tells me right there that they have no idea what they're talking about. You know nothing about space tourism. You've read a BuzzFeed article about it. No, I'm not trying to bark up Buzz, BuzzFeed's tree or anything. You've read one or two articles about space flight. You understand that space flight tourism is a thing, but you you don't really understand what space flight is about. Oh, it's polluting. Is it though? Yeah, of course. Do they drive a car to work? Well, probably not in this day and age, am I right? <laughs> Do you drive a car around? Do you use electricity? You're polluting too. And don't get me wrong, this is not about who pollutes more and who pollutes less. A spaceflight tourist is putting money into the spaceflight industry. That's expanding the spaceflight economy. We expand the spaceflight economy to a point where we can get people off planet. You can end up, you know, building cities in space instead of building them on Earth. Blue Origin has a stated goal of doing this. If you build cities in space, you don't need to worry about transport. All you can do is just float around, right? You don't need to worry about it. So that's more money towards space flight and towards ba uh, basically one of the possible outcomes to be able to keep, keep us from fricking up this planet too much. Just a thought. Hey, Chef Zo. Hope all is well for 2022. Everything's good. Humans are pollution. Damn right, Pan Pe uh, Penta. Yeah, absolutely. You're polluting right now. I'm polluting right now with all my computers on. I have a carbon footprint. Duh. I'm cognizant of that. Uh, obviously. Do you buy stuff on Amazon? Yeah, there you go. Damn right. No, there's a Penta in here, not a Panta. You're a Panta. Got him. Like, once again, I'm not trying to... Like, don't get me wrong. We should be trying to trying to preserve earth in a natural state and part of that is if we can if we if we can establish a viable transportation system into space right so like flying like a plane ticket to space so, so to speak 
If we can do that, then we can pollute up there where there's nothing. It's easier. Polluting up there is no problem. It's just a vacuum. Who cares? There's no environment to contaminate up there. There's only what we create. That is one of many viable ways that we can help fight climate change. And yes, the rocket does pollute, of course. Duh. Every, everything pollutes. You, you, that's, how, that's how thermodynamics, not thermodynamics, conservation of energy, conservation of matter, of course. You want, to, you want to do something. You want to, you want to do something that creates work. It's going to, you're going to have a byproduct. Mass, that mass just doesn't evaporate into, into space. Unless it's a Hydrolox rocket, and then it does, but that's another story. Airplanes produce 400,000 times the pollution than rockets do. Yeah, Doxy, but I find if you say that to people, if you say that to somebody that, you know, is like, oh, rocket only ro oh, rockets only pollute, you tell them that about the airline industry, they'll be like, well, well we need planes. It's just, once again, I, not to sound like a condescending dick, right, but if somebody comes at me and say, oh, well, only space flight, space flight tourism only pollutes, that tells me that they're not very well versed in what space flight is and what it's about. So I wouldn't use that necessarily as an opportunity to turn my nose up at them, but try to explain it. And if they don't want to, if, if I try to explain it and they're like, meh, whatever, that means they got their mind made up and you're wasting your time. So. Yeah, there you go, Cam here. That's right. Yeah, the front fell off, Alex. Mm -hmm. Signard says, unless it's antimatter, then you do, in fact, have mass that just goes poof at the rate of E equals MC squared. Okay, Signard, put the dunce cap on and go to the back of the class. Go to the back of the class. Go. You're behind White Claw. Go. Go. No, no, get the dunce cap. Boo this man! <laughs> Boo this man! Everything pollutes. Exactly, PY. Like, you're barking up the wrong tree if you're worried about pollution and, and you being like, oh, rockets only pollute. All right. You ever order anything off Amazon? Somebody already said it. You ever order anything off Amazon? Great, so do you. And you probably pollute way more than a rocket does. Buy that cheap headphones, uh, buy those cheap headphones on Amazon? Yeah, it came across the, came across the ocean on a container ship. Guess what that container ship is using to get across the ocean? Fossil fuels. Oops. You know, you, if you're worried about pollution, and don't get me wrong, I'm not, in the same breath, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be worried about pollution. Oh, absolutely. You, <laughs> yeah, it's probably something you should take into account. You don't want to crap where you eat, so to speak. Uh, you're barking up the wrong tree. I thought they wanted to launch James Webb on SLS, but the rocket wasn't ready yet. James Webb was always slated for Arian 5 for like 20 years, Jay. <laughs> the funny thing is, dude, is that James Webb was slated... When James Webb was first decided that it should launch on Arian 5, Arian 5 was brand new. There's a brand new rocket in the late 90s. Now, the James Webb Space Telescope, the actual launch, was one of the last Arian 5 launches before it gets replaced with Arian 6. Oops. <laughs> hey, it worked. I mean, it worked. And speaking of that, they're going to fold out the uh, the port and starboard mirrors soon, which is pretty sweet. They have the... Uh, they they deployed the radiation... Not the radiation shield. The aft radiator, which is pretty cool. The analogy I like to present is that the entire launch vehicle industry pollutes an entire year less than a single hour of vehicle traffic. Yeah, there you go, Alex. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I know. That's, yeah. yeah, no. I always find it funny the people that try to turn your turn their nose up at you, like they're a better person because they don't support space flight. It's like you have no idea what you're talking about. You guys know that you guys ever seen No Country Old for Old Men? You have no idea what you're talking about. What's the most that you've lost on a coin flip? No, don't put it in the register. Keep it. It's your lucky coin. When is Arian 6 going into service? Should be by the end of the year, Wiser, but who knows. COVID really screwed up the European space program. Like, pretty bad. 
Oh, jeez. Well, Tess, I hope everybody's okay. James Webb Space Telescope was made to watch alien TV. Modern Earth TV sucks. Well, you're half right, Dougie. <laughs> Speaking of bad decisions... Oh, I saw it, Alex. I, I was reading it this morning. I saw the whole thing. Yeah, he... I don't know, man. I get, I understand the tooting your own horn thing, but jeez, man. You don't have a problem when anybody else does that. <laughs> Mistakes on my part. Eh, it is what it is, man. It is a great movie, Scrub. No Country is a freaking amazing flick. You know, where, why, why doesn't... Why don't people say, like, oh, my God, SpaceX is launching Starlink. All the Starlink launches are on Falcon 9s. I wouldn't really call that a win. Like, bro, come on. Just give them that, man. Just give them that. They just launched James Webb, and everything went absolutely perfect. It actually went better than perfect. Like, just get... All right. Like, I like dumping on the European space program as much as the next guy. Where's your crew launch vehicle? Seriously, make one. What the hell's the matter with you? You made a, hu you made a rocket that's designed to launch humans, and you never launched a human on it. It's pathetic. What the hell, guys? What are you doing? What are you doing? See, like, I don't, I don't mind dumping on the European space program either, but you just let them have that one. Like, it's fine. It's fine. We don't know. <laughs> You're European. We can't have anything. <laughs> just let, just, 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 you, you, you can take that win. That's fine. It's okay. I think what Eric was trying to say is that it's not really a win if the government says that you have to launch them on that vehicle, which I understand because they got pissed when a European company launched a payload on a Falcon 9 a little while back, so I, I get it. Like, Europeans want to launch European satellites on European rockets? Oh, please, tell me more. <laughs> Why is that? It's fine when we do it. It's fine when the Russians do that. Why is it not fine for the Europeans? Like, I don't, I don't understand the argument, other than just a way to dump on expendable launch vehicles, which is nothing more than what we'd expect from that guy. Like, I get it. I understand what you're trying to say. From European soil? No, from South American soil. Yeah, right? A human-rated vehicle would deduct too much from the baguette fiscal budget. You have to spend a lot of money. It is not defense spending. We spend it on cheese and wine. That is our defense budget. European-ish soil. Uh, yeah, Jackery, that one's coming up to me, too. Rip. It is an art de vie. <laughs> No, NASA, no, no, NASA, that is so not right. <laughs> no, Mikey, no, no, Mikey, no. <laughs> yeah, sometimes, Dino. It's weird. Why are you telling us that? Oh, my God, sorry. <laughs> I appreciate it. Yeah, just give them the win. You guys can have that win. I mean, you kind of you kind of rig the rules in your favor, but who doesn't? Like, the Russians do that. We do that. Probably more than anybody. SpaceX definitely does that, <laughs> Why is it like I don't understand? Like, like you just gonna said that? Hey, they wanted to they want to launch their satellites on their rocket. Okay. In other news, water is wet. Mikey, I just sent you an email. No, seriously, it, it'll never get old. No, Mikey, no, no, that is so not r Michael. Michael, why? <laughs> Spent too much money on Gouda. To be fair, Gouda is pretty good. No, Michael, no, no. That's awesome. <laughs> France, we shall engulf the entire world. Hey, see, Kraken, French bread is awesome. It's very good. Very good. You put some butter, put some garlic on it, put it in the oven. Hmm. Mm. Very good. Yeah, too much sea traffic in that area, Mike, for rocket launches. That's the problem. Launching from Sicily could work. You'd be very constricted, though. But anyway, you guys want to see what's... Uh, speaking of SpaceX, while we're here, I mean, I talked about James Webb already. Do we want to see what's Gucci? Yes, I just said that. I'm sorry. 
uh, with uh, Starship. Let's go see what's going on with SpaceX's new launch vehicle. I'm going to switch this over there. Also, Gucci pants. Boom. Fun fact, there are actual laws made so that we could ensure baguettes respected the form factor and flavor established in Paris. <laughs> really? <laughs> All right. <laughs> if you add seven TV emotes, this should be the first one. Okay. Oh, that's amazing. Serious, yeah. I mean, basically, we defined in the law that baguettes would keep the same length. I... You know what, Alex? I'll be honest with you. Everybody thinks the world's going to hell in a handbasket lately, right? Everybody does. Everybody does. Not to get, like, super philosophical, right? Everybody thinks the world's going to hell in a handbasket. You know what? With that law, I would be worried if there wasn't a law like that, all right? It's like, uh, it's like when the pandemic first started. Brimo and I were watching a, a Lions game, and they got, they got their tail handed to them. You know what? And that let me know that everything's going to be okay. Everything's going to be all right. You know? France literally has a law denoting how you should make French bread and the size. You know what? I would expect nothing less. Everything's going to be fine. Everything is going to be fine. Everything's going to be all right. Because that, that's what I would expect. Like, okay, that's good. That is a datum that you can use to help, you know, tell you that, you know, everything's going to be fine. Your, bag, your baguette is too small. This is against the law. I do not have enough ratio of baguette to cheese. This is terrible. What are you doing? Off with his head. I can't tell if you've activated British sarcasm mode. I may have been channeling a little bit of Jeremy Clarkson there. But, yeah. It should be a law. It should not be a law, but a standard. Having a law means penalty or jail. No. No, no. It... No, it has... No, it has to be... No. In France, that would be a law. That makes sense. That makes sense. You know, it's like... France has a lot of laws about baguettes. And how restaurants need to have baguettes at all times. Just in case someone needs to have cheese and wine with French bread. Yep. Okay. Okay. Yep. Pulse check. Do Americans still like firearms? Yep. Okay. Yep. Everything is going to be fine. We're good. Yep. Nope. Nothing has changed. Yep. British people still like complaining about things? Yep. 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 Everything's fine. See? That's how you know everything's going to be all right. Stuff like that. <laughs> Much has happened since the EU banana curvature requirements. What? I don't want to. You know what? I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I don't want to know. I don't. I don't want to know. Ferrari still losing Formula One championships. Yep. Everything's gonna be just fine. And on that bombshell, time to get back to space news. Thank you very much. Good night. That's, yeah, see, Alex, that's how I know everything's going to be fine. Hey. Hey. This is Boca Chica, Texas, and this here is something that looks like I made out of Meccano when I was 10. But in fact, this is one of the most complicated space programs in the world. <clears throat> I'm going to go farm stuff now. I'll be back. Yeah, look at that. Chopstick arms are moving around last night. That's really freaking cool. Guys, this footage is uh, brought to you by our buddies over at NASA Spaceflight. Holy frick, that's cool. Look at that thing. 
that the, those are the catcher arms that's going to catch the stage when it comes back down and lands. Okay, look, if you're looking at it and going like, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, they'll do that. Yeah, I don't blame you. No one's ever done something like that before. I don't think it's going to work on the first try, but damn is it cool. In the world. Needs more nasally talk. Yeah. Nice, selfish. Yep. I don't. I don't. I don't blame you. If you, you, you know, you don't have your plums right. You won't want to go to the hospital. Yeah, maybe Supercraft. Who knows? In Hearts of Iron Four, I'm having the exact same issue in Spain with Zukov's volunteers as you did. The only time I've ever been cut off in several thousand hours. Rip. Discovery. Go and drop. How are the lateral movements actuated? I'm not sure, Alex. Also, the quick disconnect tests are awesome. QD full speed test. Did you call me a cutie? Stop flirting with me. Go away. Ooh, hold on. Pause. This is coming from everything SpaceX. Let's take a look here. Oh, it's a it's a cap from Lab Padre. Watch the hood disconnect. Oh, clink. Clunk. So w what you're seeing is a cover going over the fueling umbilicals. This thing right here, fueling umbilicals is a nice way to say that's where they put the, that's where they put the explodey stuff inside of the rocket, the explodey juice. Now, that is a carrier umbilical assembly and a carrier, uh, uh, a tail service mast umbilical carrier. That's kind of the, kind of what they're called. Space, I'm sure SpaceX has their own name for it. I'm using shuttle nomenclature, but it's the same, same idea. Uh, the two kind of tubes that you see right there are for the liquid fuel and the liquid methane. And then there's a bunch of other auxiliary commodities that go in the vehicle like nitrogen and helium. Uh, liquid nitrogen, liquid... I don't know if they're using liquid helium. They're probably using gas, but... And then this hood right there is designed to shut because this thing would be disconnecting when the rocket actually launches off of this platform. So you don't want this thing being exposed to the bottom of the rocket. You know, this umbilical is still under a restraining hood. That thing I got from her, it could be exposing itself. And you don't want the quick disconnect exposing itself during a launch. So that hood right there is on a huge cantilever arm that drops down and protects the umbilical from the massive outgassing event that's going to be happening down here when Super Heavy flies, which is really cool. It's really neat. Yeah, I don't know, Mike. Yeah, if you want a little bit of scale for that quick disconnect hood, look at the people standing next to it on the left. That thing is almost a, a two stories tall. It's huge. This whole scale is really, really difficult to understand until you see people standing on it and walking around. You're like, <laughs> okay, that's not small. Oh, frick, we even got tiny people. Little bits. Pretty neat, Ernok. Yeah, well, that's pretty neat. Is Super Heavy TWR off the pad known? Sile, it's gonna get off the pad quick. I will tell you that right now. Space shuttle fast. What? How do I know that? It has 50 mega newtons of thrust, about 15 million pounds coming off the pad. Um, that's double a Saturn V. Yeah, yeah, it'll go fast. 1.3, 1.4 TWR off the pad, I'm guessing. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. 1.5 is what SpaceX is targeting. See what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Fast. Super Heavy has double the amount of thrust that's really needed, and that's on purpose. Why is that on purpose? Well, you could lose half your engines. The thing will still get to where you need to go. It'll just be a little bit slower, but it'll still get there. Yeah, that's the redundancy there. The redundancy is how many engines do you want? Y y yes, yes. Uh, just want to shout out to White Claw. Re re real men drink White Claw. What's the launch mass? North of a couple thousand tons, Penta. Easily. How much thrust was the N1 plan to have? About half of that username. 
JLGs are so sketchy. It's fine. All right, so this is over at the build site. They're moving pieces of building around at the build site so they can build rockets more uh, better at the build site. Great sentence, man. I mean, yeah, Pen Penta, are we talking about when it's fully fueled or when the vehicle has nothing in it? When it has nothing in it, it's still pretty dang heavy. <laughs> yeah, Jonathan, it's funny. That whole interview was just weird, man. <laughs> it's one of the weirdest Elon interviews I've watched. Yeah, they're moving sub-assemblies around. Can you break down how much thrust is needed to lift one pound in Earth gravity? Break down? How much thrust do you need to lift one pound? Uh, well, you'd need to be able to have enough thrust to be able to accelerate at an upward force higher than 9.81 meters a second per second. Yeah, I know, JJ. I think that's why he does it, because he likes rocking the boat. I mean, what else do you want to know, J-Rock? I'll be honest, the metric would be easier to do this, but... Uh... Just smaller numbers that are easier to digest. Well, uh, you would need one pound of thrust to move one pound of whatever. So what does that mean? Uh, uh, okay, so I don't need smaller numbers to be able to digest this, all right, here. So Wouldn't that, that would be 1.0 TWR, Kamer. Yeah, you'd need like 1.1 pounds of thrust to move one pound of whatever. But you're not taking that, see, J-Rock, this gets more complicated than that. It's not as linear as, as you might think, because now you have a rocket full of fuel. And that fuel drains over time, so your thrust to weight ratio is dynamic. It changes. So you, it's a little bit more complicated than that. Don't, J-Rock, if, if you're trying to understand force here, in terms of like what you need to move stuff into space. Uh, I'll use a Saturn V. A Saturn V has seven and a half million pounds of thrust. What does that mean? That means the Saturn V is pushing up with the same amount of force that would push down if you, if you were trying to carry a 7.5 million pound counterweight. Does that make sense? That amount of force pushing down, right? is the, the amount of force that the Saturn V uses to push up. So, super heavy is going to be somewhere in the ballpark of 15 million pounds of thrust. It has the same up pushing force as 15 million pounds of lead. Like if you had a lead block that was 15 million pounds, the amount of force that is putting on the ground from gravity, right? is the same amount of force that the Saturn V pushes up with. So we're we're talking like the Saturn V pushes up with enough with enough force to move a skyscraper around. Well, it is a skyscraper basically, but not not necessarily like a skyscraper. Maybe a big off like a small office building or something. It's a lot of we're talking a lot of a lot of force here. Mhm. Mm it's a, that that's a easier way to explain it. Fifteen million pounds of thrust. Yeah, no problem, J Rock. Basically, a lot of force. I mean, you saw how big that Saturn V is. Still, nobody has made a big, a big enough rocket since this and SLS since, man. It's a lot of force, dude. Oh, there goes the sub-assembly. Look at that. It's like a big erector set. 
you, you think that building is small. Look at the people on the lift and the to the left of the thing hanging. No, I haven't more shots. Yep, Jim, they're building a second high bay. That's the same. It's a little it's actually going to be a little bit taller than the high bay to the left, but it's twice as wide. It's a very big building. Just can't wait to see that Falcon Heavy launch. Uh, J-Rock, so Falcon Heavy, for instance, has 4.5 million pounds of thrust. 4.5. Super Heavy has 15. It's like three times the amount of force of a Falcon Heavy. And a Falcon Heavy, of course, is three times the amount of a Falcon 9, right? We're talking pretty big numbers. It's hard to wrap your mind around this stuff, dude. Look at the frickin' people, dude. Do you think they'll ever strap Falcon Heavies on Super Heavy, similar to a Falcon 9 with two boosters? Jerrock, you gotta understand that the way that Starship and Super Heavy are, what they're designed to do is be one integrated system. So what does that mean? I keep saying about how Super Heavy has way more thrust than what it needs. It doesn't need boosters attached to the side. Um, because Starship and Super Heavy, the, syst the, the system engineering behind that is supposed to be more like a, uh, a 737 or a 747. So Starship's supposed to be operated like a plane. That's the idea behind it. That's what I mean about systems engineering. SpaceX wants to make Starship work like an airplane, meaning launch it, land it, refuel it, stack the rocket, launch it again, right? Because they want to operate it more like a plane than a regular rocket, say, saying that, oh, you know, Super Heavy could have attachable Super Heavies on the side and you'd make a heavy, you'd make Starship Super Heavy, Super Heavy, right? It would be like saying, oh, we could give a 747 more range if we strap two 737s to the side. Remember, because Starship is trying to work like airplanes, right? Now, once again, do I, do I not want to see that? I'm, I'm, I would like to see a 747 with two 737s strapped to the side. Yes, I, I'm not saying I don't want that, but also that would be very weird. I mean, I, that'd be kind of cool. It'd be kind of cool. 737 attachable boosters on a 747 to boost the range. That'd be pretty neat. I'm pretty sure, I'm pretty sure something might go wrong there. Deployment confirmed. Cool. How would they be do attached? Like belly to belly? Uh, that's not my department, Jax. <laughs> Last please, boss. Okay. Or I could finish, you know, a thought to explain things to people. There's only been, what, five super heavy class lifters built? In terms of thrust output, Saturn V, Saturn V N1, Energy, SLS, and Super Heavy. Um, the Space shuttle, but yeah. Space news. China's Mars orbit snaps amazing photos above the red planet. Neat. Someone under the that circus we just said, I wish I was get my delusional fever and get back to being a rational human bit early. Alex, and this is the thing, man, and I think this is a big, big, big problem that people fail to recognize. You can't change somebody's mind that doesn't want their mind changed. At this point, you're arguing with a brick wall. This is why I don't bother with Twitter. Because, you know, the second I say something on Twitter, someone's going to be like, no, I disagree with you. And you know what, man? I don't have to prove anything to those people. I don't. I, I don't. I don't want to waste my time on people that don't want to change their mind, or at least don't have an open mind. Like, if you're so set in your ways, 
you know, about this stuff uh, that you can't even take a little bit of discourse without being like, oh, you're delusional. You, you're probably not a functioning human being. Like, that's that, dude. That's how children act. I don't. I don't. That's not my jam, man. I don't do that. You're definitely right about not participating in the circus. I don't even bother, dude. That's why all my Twitter posts are just like, wow, look at this. This is really cool. I made one post about Elon being a hard worker and people were like, like this was like a couple of weeks ago and there was a, you know, one or two people in the comments that were like, no, he didn't. And I'm just like, what a waste, what a waste of time, dude. I just admire the guy's work ethic. Leave me alone. <laughs> NASA never included a CubeSat to take a selfie of their satellite. They used CubeSats for navigation, Swishio. What the hell are you talking about? I did see that. We saw that yesterday, Pythos. That's hilarious. James Webb with pants. Okay, Mena, that's weird. Dream Chaser CES video. Okay. I'd really appreciate it if Sierra would actually, you know, launch stuff and not just post a lot of videos. But hey, whatever. It's building a space shuttle is difficult, so <laughs> you know you got to be patient with this stuff. It doesn't mean I don't want it quicker, though. <laughs> I'm gonna back this footage up a little bit, guys, because I've been everybody's been looking at this stuff. Hey, that has compressed helium in it. You can tell because of the way it is. Saying that China took two cameras to Mars in their first mission to Mars for PR sake. That's pretty cool. We should do that too. Yeah, we'll just send people there. Space shuttle. Am I a joke to you? How hard can it be? Yeah, right. <laughs> Am I a joke to you? Who did this? Who did this? D no! Scrapped arrow surfaces, look at that. SDS is in the trash. You think this is a freaking game? Oh, guys, a little bit of useful information. See that dumpster up there? Only stainless steel goes in that dumpster. Don't ask me how I know. SDS is stainless scrap. Or you could just ruin the joke and probably the evening. Hey, Ismik, how are you? What's that motor and actuator for? Huh. Oh, that whole ring. Oh, that's for rotating it. That whole ring moves. Oh, that's pretty neat. Is that going to tent two? No, I don't think so. Who saw it? Who saw the Mustang? Quick Artemis 2 core stage update photo. We looked at the B roll footage from yesterday, Hellhyber. Is that what that's from? That's a really, really high res picture. Oh yeah, there's the hydrogen tank, man. It's happening. So this is back at the launch site. This is the super heavy booster. You know, you can tell because of the way it is. Have you seen the new Chevy Ridgeline? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hello, well, Pythos, uh, Swishio, I don't know if you know, but one of NASA's missions out to the moon, I think it was InSight, if I'm remembering correctly, deployed two CubeSats behind it after after the rocket let it go. They deployed two CubeSats that flew in formation with the, with the payload, 
and that was its communication system. They took the antennas and they put it on the vehicle. They they took it off the vehicle and they put it on the CubeSats instead. Yeah, Marco. There you go. Mm -hmm. That was the name of it. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah, it was actually a really awesome mission. I don't think we had cameras from it per se, but yeah, I, I get it. You know, more pictures from Mars. I get the gist of what you're saying. That was actually a really cool mission. A CubeSat, a portable CubeSat constellation, which is really neat. That's real. That dude. That's really cutting edge stuff. Yeah, they were just relays. Exactly, Pythos. We should, we should launch a bunch of those into cycler orbits. Wouldn't that be cool? Cycler orbit communication network. That's actually a really good idea. A cycler communication system. Someone has to have thought of that. There's no way we're the first people to think of that. Ew, Hibbit. That's disgusting. Test it in KSP? I need to test it in KSP. There's no way someone hasn't thought of that. There's no, There's not a chance. <laughs> no way. Not a good idea. Cycler orbit still needs fuel. Okay. Starlink needs fuel. Every satellite constellation needs fuel, Louisa. What's your point? I know about that, Seve. Yeah, it was already linked. Solar System Pony Express. Yeah, it's our, NASA already thought of that. A year ago. Okay, cool. Yeah, all right, that's been thought of. That's what I thought. All right, cool. Let's get back to starship gazing. That would just make the signal take longer to... Why not use, use lasers? Um, if we have ships going on cycler orbit signered for, you know missions to Mars that just putting it out there would probably be a good idea. Yeah, I, I know. Yeah, no, Endo, it's actually, that'd be pretty sweet. Literally set up a railroad track, so to speak, to Mars uh, for communications. Like, think of it like cell towers on a highway. Cell towers next to a highway. That's, that's the idea. Just hit up Elon for your cut when he does it. Why stop at Mars? Just put them anywhere. I mean, Dark Nate's for the same reason. Well, why just, why not, why put cell towers next to highways? Why not just put them everywhere? Because it's infrastructure? It costs money? I don't know, man. <laughs> trying to think what a future spaceflight economy would look like. Some type of communications array other than the Deep Space Network, is going to need to exist at some point. Let's call it the Buzz Network. I like the way you think. Maybe, Sile. Yeah, maybe. Communications 101. Qu'est-ce que c'est that because that's hilarious more boosters more boosters more boosters wow what are these big big arms for i've missed most of the talk those things procyon catching the first and second stage yeah those are the catching arms man elon calls them and spacex calls them chopsticks because of the karate kid where they catch the fly with the chopsticks same idea same energy what i'm trying to tell you is that elon musk is the karate kid 
If Elon Musk is the Karate Kid, who's Mr. Miyagi? Buzz? Von Brown? Salvatore Bruno. <laughs> <laughs> Carl Sagan, these are all no wrong answers. <laughs> Jim Bryan said, yeah. The pudding is. Isaac Newton, yeah, yeah. Tom Mueller, <laughs> still, still no wrong answers. <laughs> uh, those look like electronically actuated valves right there. What is this on top of? Hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Oh, that's on the test booster, huh? Hmm. Huh. Bernie Ecclestone? Okay, one wrong answer. Two wrong answers. Notice how nobody said Jeff. Alex, I swear, dude, one of these days, Blue Origin is just gonna roll a new Glenn out of their out of their shop, and everyone's gonna be like, just like they were with the Pathfinder. It's gonna happen, man. Neil Hamburger. Who's that? The Hamburglar? Uh, I, I've always preferred Mayor McCheese. Dread, come on now. I'd be surprised if they made the BE4 for the end of the year for New Glenn. Yeah, they're, they're scaling for Vulcan first. Blue Origin is using Vulcan basically for propulsion research before they pull the trigger on New Glenn fully. But that doesn't mean that they can't do those things in parallel. Uh, there was an attempt, Maya. There was an attempt. Looks like one of the heat exchangers is on on the pad. So guys, what we're looking at here is anytime you see a lot of condensation like that coming off of the uh, the GSE or ground support equipment, uh, let me just break that nomenclature down real quick. Uh, what is GSE? In rocket science, GSE is anything that's used to launch the rocket that isn't the rocket. Straight up. So the pad and all the stuff that you need to make the pad work. Anytime you see GSE steaming like that it's not steaming it's actually condensation that means they're moving propellants around or they're well a more specific thing to say would be they're moving commodities around commodities when it comes to rocket science are basically everything that goes into the rocket that isn't the rocket so fuel oxidizer uh a lot of rockets use pneumatic systems uh so they use nitrogen falcon 9 like has nitrogen as a commodity for its thrusters uh, on the first and second stage. Uh, it could be hydrazine, it could be nitrogen tetroxide, liquid methane, liquid oxygen, uh, anything like that. The, if you see condensation like that, that means that there's cold pipes or something that something is cold that's not the tanks. The tanks are insulated. Uh, that means they're moving they're moving commodities around on the GSE meaning they're moving nitrogen somewhere. They're putting nitrogen into a tank. They're filling up a tank with fuel or nitrogen or oxidizer. It could be any one of those things. Just in case people are wondering what that steam is. It's actually condensation from the cold pipes. Or it could be the result of a heat exchanger. That's the, that's the heat exchanger. So what that is, what this thing is that looks like a, a steampunk steam engine Sorry, bad analogy. That that thing that with all the pipes coming out of it, that's a heat exchanger. Uh, so you're looking at the cooling loop on a heat exchanger to keep the propellants cold. Could be that too. Yeah, stupid. I hear you. Condensation punk. Yeah, see, this is coming out of an exchanger. That's a heat exchanger.
Yeah, see this thing looks like a freaking elephant. That's a that's a heat exchanger right there. That's the, that's basically the air conditioning for the commodities to keep them cold. There's a lot of commodities on GSE: liquid nitrogen, liquid oxygen, liquid methane. In order for those to stay as a liquid, you got to keep them cold. So you need a very big air conditioner. Long story short, that's an industrial, <laughs> an industrial air conditioner, man. <laughs> we get it, Booster. You vape, yeah. Cool, man. All right. So there's one last thing I wanted to show here. A little bit of little bit of SLS news, for, uh, kind of follow up to the forward join information that we got yesterday. Check out this picture coming from the NASA archives. We have the SLS hydrogen hydrogen tank, the inner tank, which is the connector piece that connects the oxygen and hydrogen tanks, and then the forward skirt. We have four out of the five sub-assemblies for the second SLS core stage in this picture, which is pretty freaking cool, actually. I need that in my van in the summer. I mean, yeah. Condensation punk. What'd you call me, Vasya? What'd you call me? Yeah, that's the SRB attachment point right there. See that? Optics, or it could be a vent line as well. There's the hydrogen. Uh, th uh, this is the hydrogen venting umbilical, which is the ground umbilical carrier plate assembly, which carries the hydrogen gas that comes from filling up the rocket with propellants. Uh, it carries the hydrogen gas away from the vehicle because hydrogen gas makes things Hindenburg if you're not careful. There's the gaseous oxygen ground umbilical carrier plate, or the Gox cup. At least I think if they're using shuttle nomenclature, that's what they call. That's what it would be called. A Ute. So that's the hydro hydrogen gup and the the Gox gup. <laughs> it's called the gup. I'm serious. Ground umbilical carrier plate. That's what it's called. And then there's the top of the hydrogen tank. If you notice, the top of the hydrogen tank has a pipe coming out at the five o'clock position. That is the Hydrogen tank vent line, which leads to the ground umbilical carrier plate, which is in the five o'clock position on the inner tank. Funny how that works. It's almost like this piece was designed to connect into this piece. Gox cup. The space shuttle had a Gox ground umbilical carrier plate, but the space shuttle, because it had a pointed tank, Alex used the beanie cap. So it didn't have a ground umbilical carrier plate like that. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> beanie, I didn't realize that it would, well, load up pictures of beanie caps. <laughs> it's that thing up there. Sorry for the potato quality. <laughs> Jeez, Googling beanie cap gives you beanie caps? <laughs> Please tell me more. Thanks for the update, EJ. <laughs> All right. Guys, that's pretty much going to do it for Space News. There's not much else. We got a Starlink launch. We got to talk about Starship. We got to talk about SLS. We got to talk about Delta V and stuff. We got to do that to keep it sharp. Got to keep talking about it to keep it sharp. I'll, I'll check out the Dream Chaser stuff a little bit later. More shots if you're still here.